This video is going to be a comprehensive take on rotator cuff related pain syndrome. Now this is a broad clinical term used to describe pain arising from the rotator cuff area and the surrounding tissues in the shoulder. Now typically we'll see pain that's worsened with overhead activity around the back or even lateral part of the arm. And this has to do with a wide array of different conditions such as tendinopathy which is degeneration or overuse of the tendons in the rotator cuff, subacromial bursitis, subacromial impingement, or even partial tears in the rotator cuff that happen over time. Um, of course we can have tears due to trauma. We're doing an exercise and we feel a tweak now this isn't necessarily what this video is going to be about because in acute conditions like this the rehab is going to be more straightforward. We just need to gradually expose that range of motion and progressively overload those damaged tissues to get them back to baseline and stronger. But this video I want to cover the biomechanics of how shoulder pain might come on in the first place, especially if it's due to overhead activity. Now, I don't always like using biomechanics to talk about pain because we know somebody with two different objective findings can have the exact same complaints of pain and the exact same symptoms. So we can't say, oh, we have shoulder pain because of a weakness here. But what we can use biomechanics for is understanding a framework and an approach to guide our rehab process based on the client's unique limitations. So if we understand the segmental interactions with the rib cage, the scapula, and the humerus, we can see how the rotator cuff will function most efficiently so it doesn't have to be overused in these overhead positions. The biggest mistake I see in rotator cuff rehab and physical therapy is just thinking it's a capacity issue of the rotator cuff. So this leads clinicians to just prescribe a bunch of external rotation-based exercises targeted for the rotator cuff as if it's weak. Now they'll do a bunch of muscle testing to decide that it's a weak tissue, but the problem is if you muscle test somebody with acute pain or chronic pain in their shoulder, in those tissues, we, we know pain is going to inhibit muscle function, it's going to inhibit strength. This might be a false reading. I'm more concerned about looking at why these rotator cuff muscles are being overworked in the first place especially in an overhead position where they're not meant to be the prime movers, they're meant to help stabilize the shoulder. And what we know is muscles are always going to be strongest in their mid-range. They're not going to be strongest in their end ranges or shortened ranges. So as we go overhead, the rotator cuff does have to lengthen because the tissues like the infraspinatus and teres minor, they connect to the inside part of the scapula all the way to the outside of the shoulder at the greater tubercle. So if we think of this red band here as the infraspinatus, one of the external rotators of the shoulder, part of the rotator cuff, as this humerus goes overhead and the scapula has to glide with it, we can see how it maintains a proper length tension relationship within this muscle. The scapula will have to upwardly rotate and in the initial stages of flexion, it'll protract, so the scapula will wrap around the rib cage as the arm goes overhead to face this glenoid cavity forward. If the scapula is unable to protract and it stays relatively retracted, you can see how the space from here to here, the glenoid tubercle, gets further apart. When we go overhead and then the shoulder starts to deviate into internal rotation too early, that rotator cuff is lengthening and it's not going to be able to function at its strongest position mechanically. So the goal of the exercises I'm gonna show you here today is to be able to keep the shoulder in the sagittal plane for as long as possible and delay the humerus from internally rotating early to keep the rotator cuff working in a mechanically advantageous position. Getting full overhead range of motion requires internal rotation and scapular external rotation and retraction to get that full overhead flexion. But we want to be able to delay it as much as possible. We want to make sure can the, the muscles that connect the rib cage to the scapula, the lats, the teres major, can these muscles lengthen to allow that scapula to upwardly rotate? And can 
we actually produce scapular protraction and maintain that as we go overhead. There's a big strength component there, as well as the lower trapezius muscle back there to allow for that upward rotation to go smoothly. Because if the scapula doesn't move, then that means there's going to be more effort from the humerus to produce overhead flexion, especially under load. So if we're barbell pressing a lot, if we're doing handstand push-ups, if we're doing any sort of pressing overhead, and we start to see a lot of deviation into internal rotation, maybe as we fatigue, or if we're just unable to go overhead unloaded, and maybe it's a range of motion issue, we're gonna have to either create some space to move more efficiently overhead, or we're gonna have to create that strength in the serratus anterior and lower traps. This is why I think developing strong scapular protraction and developing strong upward rotation through function of the lower trapezius is an extremely crucial part to rotator cuff rehab. And we're not even going directly after the rotator cuff in this instance because we want to give the rotator cuff more of a fighting chance to support the shoulder and the structures in the shoulder overhead as opposed to just building their capacity and not looking at why these muscles are overworked in the first place. So with that being said, let's dive into the exercises. We're going to look at creating space, improving that shoulder flexion while maintaining some external rotation. And then we're gonna go into scapular protraction strengthening. And then we're gonna look more at the upward rotation aspect of the scapula, still strengthening the serratus anterior and the lower trapezius in both open and closed kinetic chain. Okay, the first exercise is the banded external rotation in shoulder flexion. Now the idea of this one is to create space and improve that overhead flexion flexibility. Remember, if the humerus is unable to stay in the sagittal plane, it'll deviate into internal rotation early when we bring the arm overhead, putting unnecessary strain on the rotator cuff. So we're going to make sure we have our elbow at the edge of the bench and our shoulders level with each other. We wanna maintain a full posterior pelvic tilt and we want to perform contract relax cycles here. So for our isometric contraction, we're gonna drive the elbow into the bench while simultaneously pulling against band resistance into internal rotation. Hold five to 10 seconds, take a big exhale and relax. And we can either allow the hand to move into more external rotation, or we could simply posterior tilt and protract the scapula more, which relatively brings us into more flexion. So perform this two to three cycles of five to 10 second intervals. This next exercise is the foam roller elbow plank and one of my favorites for improving protraction capacity and strengthening the serratus anterior. So we're gonna place our elbows on the roller and we're gonna pull our hands out into as much external rotation as possible, making sure we maintain protraction and posterior tilt. We wanna think about pushing our rib cage backward in space as our elbows drive into the roller. And we wanna do this without excessively just rounding at the spine. Spinal flexion can facilitate protraction, but it doesn't mean you are protracting. Okay, variation one, digging the toes into the ground with the knees directly below the hips. Now we're just simply trying to get light with our knee support on the ground. We're not actually picking them up yet. Now, of course, variation two is lifting the knees subtly off the ground while maintaining that posterior pelvic tilt and full protraction, as well as not letting the hands deviate into internal rotation. And the next variation is bringing the knees back so the knees are in line with the shoulders and hip in full hip extension. Then from there, we can go into a plank, but we have to maintain that hip extension and protraction at the scapula. We don't wanna see that anteriorly tilted plank or the hands move inwards of the elbows and deviate into that internal rotation. This is not what we're after. Now, these were all isometric variations that I like to use early on and build up to sets of 40 to 60 seconds at the end variation. Now we can add perturbations here where we're maintaining that protraction and moving into shoulder flexion. Now notice how I'm only moving about 20 degrees into shoulder flexion. We can even hold this point isometrically as well at the specific range where we tend to lose that external rotation and scapular depression. And we can also use this variation one arm at a time. So this is a very versatile exercise as you can tell. So now I am rolling the roller overhead, crushing the fist and forearm into that roller so we're really engaging that serratus anterior. And with the elbow bent, we're also creating a lot of tension in that long head of the tricep, which is actually a big scapular stabilizer. And again, we can hold this isometrically, making sure that our shoulders are staying level once again. So we're fully protracting here. It's very common to fake protraction one side at a time by rotating at the thoracic spine away. 
So as you can see, we are just moving up into shoulder flexion so that we can maintain the thumb facing upwards and elbow pit facing upwards. This shows that we're in external rotation. Once you see that elbow pit start to face away, we're losing it. We can even treat this exercise like a mobility drill and lengthen the lats as we shift our rib cage to the side and bring our chest and head through. Okay, next is the half kneeling landmine press, but we're gonna do this very specifically to target the upward rotation component of the serratus anterior. So I'm going to think about pulling and scooping my elbow upwards as I move into shoulder flexion, only going as high as I can maintain that external rotation of the shoulder once again. We don't wanna treat this like an actual shoulder press and just go overhead and let the scapula deviate into retraction and external rotation. So notice I'm pulling the elbow forward and up in this kind of scooping fashion. And I might not even extend the elbow fully. And if you do this right, you're gonna get a huge pump and burn through the serratus interior. Once again, do not fake this protraction by rotating at the thoracic spine away. Keep the shoulders level with each other. If anything, think about rotating toward that working side arm to further dissociate the rib cage from the scapula as you move overhead. Okay, now we're gonna get into some lower trap strengthening, which is also a very strong upward rotator of the scapula. So we're gonna use a supine banded Y. Now I really like supine variations because we can keep the low back crushed into the ground. So using the floor as external feedback to keep the abs on and maintain that posterior pelvic tilt as we bring the arm into flexion. Now we wanna start in somewhat of a protraction and then just allow the scapula to do what it needs to do to go overhead, maintaining that natural scapulohumeral rhythm. Now we wanna make sure we're not deviating into internal rotation of the shoulder and scapular elevation and retraction. This is what we're trying to avoid and we come off tension at the low trap. And last one of my favorite ways to strengthen the lower trapezius in a closed kinetic chain fashion is this piked shoulder flexion raise. So the first variation, we'll start with our knees supported on a bench and we're gonna start in a fully protracted plank. And from there, we're going to raise into shoulder flexion without letting our hips deviate backwards like this. We want our hips to go straight up in the air as we move into shoulder flexion and we're only going as high as we can maintain that. If hamstring flexibility is an issue, then you can keep the knees bent. And you can see those lower trap muscles bulge out when I move into shoulder flexion. So don't worry about getting full overhead flexion here because that would mean the scapula needs to retract. And the lower trap does have a slight role in retraction, but it's not its main function. The main target is to strengthen the lower trap as an upward rotator, which has to work in conjunction with the serratus anterior as we move overhead into flexion. And we can progress this by elevating the toes higher and higher instead of the knees, as well as going into a fully straight knee position. Okay guys, there you have it. These are some of my most commonly prescribed exercises for shoulder pain, especially rotator cuff related shoulder pain when it comes to overuse with overhead activities. Maybe you've had this pain on and off over the course of years. It gets better when you reduce activity, but then it just keeps coming back when you overload things again. We can't always say there's a root cause to things, but we wanna make sure the rotator cuff is able to function in its mid range and not always in a stretched and pissed off position. So if you like these exercises, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It would be much appreciated. I don't want to end this video without making the disclaimer that these exercises probably will not work for you if you do not modify your training program, at least temporarily. It's going to be smart if you're adding in some of these exercises. These do require a recovery stimulus in order to see adaptation. So you can't just add a bunch of new exercises for the shoulder on an existing program, especially when you're dealing with overload issues and lack of recovery with those tissues. So you have to take some things out of your current plan to add some things in. So whether that's rehab related, these exercises are predominantly strengthening exercises, strengthening at end range and strengthening through mid range. Now, I would suggest reducing the overall volume of your overhead activities. So these exercises will definitely work for you if you allow them to. And of course, I get questions, well, what about rotator cuff direct strengthening? I do find these are beneficial for just building the capacity to bulletproof the shoulder. But why always try to bulletproof when you can avoid getting shot in the first place?
And remember, if flexibility in space is your main issue, if you can't go overhead without that shoulder constantly deviating into internal rotation, and then the scapula having to shrug and the traps overworking here, then you're gonna need a more comprehensive approach to flexibility. Luckily, I have my supple shoulders program available on my website. If you haven't picked that up yet, I highly suggest it. It's a comprehensive mobility plan that goes through all the, the ranges the shoulder moves through. And I've seen a lot of great results with some of my students running that program so far. And I wouldn't recommend it if I haven't tested each one of these exercises personally and have seen benefits myself. Some of the biomechanics can get tricky, so if you have any questions, please write them in the comments and I'd be happy to answer them.